shut down. More gold transit trains are brought to a standstill. Thousands are now searching for a way home as protesters in solidarity with the wet sweatin' out west have blocked the tracks behind Lambton Station near Jane and St. Clair. The blockades are causing a lot of anger and confusion at Union Station during the rush hour. Sarah Levitt joins us live from there right now. Sarah, tell us what you're hearing and seeing down there. No, it's been a very hectic afternoon with all the problems here. Inside, you see lots of people staring up at the screen, trying to figure out how they're going to get home, if they can get home. Not a ton of information available on the screens, on the screens other than saying either delayed or suspended. What we do know was that earlier in the afternoon, there was uh, some problems on the Lakeshore line headed out to, uh, headed, headed out to, where was it? Uh, Pickering, yeah, exactly. Sorry about that. Uh, there were problems there. That line is now back up and running. But the issue is the Milton line, where uh, there are people out there. And so far, go uh, not giving us lots of information. They're saying uh, the train service on the Milton corridor is suspended. Just reading uh, what they've last updated, they say we are currently working on contingency plans to get customers home. So. What I've heard from customers inside trying to figure out their way is just how are they getting home? Is there an alternate route that they can take? Uh, are the trains going to come up and running anytime soon? Uh, let's hear from one person in particular a bit upset about what's happening. It's a definite inconvenience for all of these people. <laughs> so we can protest and break the law. That's what I understand, right? You can go ahead and, and block a railroad track just because you feel so opinionated about what you need to say. Like you realize you're not really affecting anyone except for just regular people like us who are just trying to get back home. So like, stop doing it. Like I, I get you have your own opinion, that's what the internet's for. Write it on there, but don't actually disrupt this because you're not getting your point across. You're just pissing everyone off and more likely people are not gonna listen to you. So this is a very fluid situation. Uh, it's really unsure when these trains are going to be up and running. One thing that uh, Go has said, Metrolinx has said, is that because of the fluid situation, because they're unsure of the various parts in play right now, they say that there is potential that this situation uh, could disrupt customers through the entire system. They do say they hope that they can get things up and running, but that they are asking people for patience during this time. All right, thank you, Sarah. Let's get to another part of that system now. We'll go to Jane and St. Clair, that area where Ramna Shazad is at for us right now. I said Lambton Station earlier. It's actually behind Lambton Arena. So what's happening there along what they call the Milton Line, Ramna? Well, Dwight, there's protesters here that are on the train tracks behind me. They've been here for about a couple of hours now. And um, in solidarity, of course, dozens of people here, a very large cr crowd has gathered beside them. They're, ch they're chanting, they're strumming. Uh, there's also police officers accompanying, accompanying the people. Uh, on the tracks. Sorry about that noise there. Uh, so the mobilization for this uh, this evening happened very quickly for this blockade uh, and online by a group calling themselves Rising Tide Toronto. Uh, we want to show you some photos that the group put out on Twitter. The group says that there have been six arrests made here by Toronto police. Now police haven't confirmed these arrests to us though they do have a large presence here at uh, at this gathering um, and as does uh, fire as well. Uh, now this blockade it's in response to the provincial police moving in to end the blockade by the Mohawks of Tyendinaga. That's at a rail line near Belleville. Protesters say they are here in solidarity with the Wet'suwet'en her hereditary chiefs who oppose the construction of the coastal gas link pipeline through their territory in northern BC. So things ramping up here. Uh, you can probably hear all of the chanting. This crowd has been growing in, people trickling in since we got here. They're, uh, they're chanting now. They're saying, if you are here tonight at this protest, that you are on the right side of history, Dwight. All right, stay on top of that situation for us, Ramna. Now, west of the city, protesters have now left the tracks they had been blocking since late last night, not far from the Aldershot Go station. Farmer Morelli joins us live from that scene now. And fire things changing there in the last hour.
Very much, Dwight. Uh, all day this has been a standoff here between police and the dozen or so protesters that have been camped out here. Uh, but just shortly after 5 o'clock, we noticed the protesters started walking up the steps where I'm standing, uh, picking up their belongings, their sleeping bags and everything, and leaving. I want you to take a look over my shoulder and, and see uh, what's left of this camp. It's pretty much empty. You can see the headlights from some of the vehicles from CN still parked on the line. Uh, you might be able to see some people in orange vests. Those are likely officials from CN now clearing that line, uh, but the protesters are all gone. The green tarps they set up and everything are completely gone. And this, of course, comes 24 hours after they first arrived to set up camp. It began last night. A small group of protesters arrived at the rail lines near the Hamilton Harbor, setting up camp in darkness. We need yeah. to spread awareness because not everybody knows about this. This was a scene this morning. A fire still burning at that camp. People were getting creative when it came to ways to join the camp. Some trekked down steep hills, others climbed fences to hike in. None were keen to speak to us. The camp spelled chaos for the morning commute for go riders trying to get into the city. With no service west of Aldershot, shuttle buses were brought in. I think it's a pretty minor inconvenience if you consider it in the context of um, Indigenous people and the Wet'suwet'en people defending their territory. While some commuters were sympathetic to the protesters, others not so much. It took us two hours to get from Burlington to Hamilton and I think it was ridiculous. Shortly after five, the protest group could be seen leaving the camp, the fire now extinguished. No word on whether they plan to come back. Now, despite that the blockade and the protest camp has now left here, uh, those disruptions are going to continue throughout the evening commute. Uh, there is still no GO rail service or GO train service uh, west of Aldershot. If you're trying to get uh, to Hamilton, you're going to have to get off at uh, Aldershot and take a shuttle bus. If you're trying to get to uh, St. Catharines or Niagara, you're going to have to get off the Burlington station uh, and again take a shuttle bus. I did have a chance to speak to Metrolinx uh, just before, um, just just before uh, six o'clock and what I was told was that uh, they don't expect these to continue into the morning but of course it is going to take some time to clear uh, the rail tracks where the camp was set up behind me. Dwight. Yeah we saw the fire on the tracks there earlier too. Thank you Farah. Now solidarity protests are taking place right across the country. In Quebec there are a number of demonstrations including one blocking railway tracks in Sherbrooke. There's also a blockade of tracks running through the Mohawk territory of Gananawagade near Montreal. In Ontario while the Mohawk camp in Tyndanega was dismantled yesterday a second camp in nearby Marysville remains. BC continues to be a focal point for demonstrations. That includes the blockade at one port of Vancouver entrance. All of this in support of those who oppose the coastal gas link pipeline in northern BC. A seemingly random hammer attack that killed a woman in Scarborough last week is now being investigated as a terrorist attack. Toronto police say today the 30-year-old suspect Saad Akhtar had his charges updated or upgraded rather to first degree murder including terrorist activity. The murder happened Friday evening near Shepherd and McCown. The woman that was killed she has been identified as 64 year old Han Cam Annie Chu. A spokesperson said the change was because of a joint investigation between Toronto Police and the RCMP's national security team. The RCMP say evidence was discovered which led investigators to believe the homicide may have been a terrorist related offense and that the public can be assured this appears to be an isolated incident. And we now know the name of the woman killed yesterday inside a body rub parlor near Dufferin and Wilson. Police say 24-year-old Ashley Noel Arzaga was murdered in the stabbing attack that also injured another woman. A 17-year-old boy was arrested and charged with first-degree murder and attempted murder. We do have a pandemic plan and we have been working provincially and territorially with our partners. Assurances from the health minister that the government is prepared should there be an outbreak of coronavirus in Canada as fears over the virus spread as fast as the disease itself. The very latest on the outbreak coming up in about seven minutes. Let's head to Colette now because we have watches and warnings and winter's back.
Yeah, winter is back. It's going to pack a punch. So we do have a big storm that's going to be moving in. And so there is now for the GTA a snowfall warning. And it's not just the GTA, all the areas you see in white where we're talking about the potential by the time this is over with. So keep in mind it's going to be lasting into Thursday, but 15 to 25 centimeters. And the worst of it is going to be what's going to be coming down for tomorrow. A little further east towards the nation's capital, winter storm warning. Some areas may see more than 30 centimeters from the system. And other areas, if you're watching us from Hamilton, for example, all the way back towards southwestern Ontario, still in a special weather statement, it's not that you're not going to feel the impact, 10 to 20 centimeters of snow possible there. And as the winds get enhanced into Thursday, it's going to be blowing around and visibility greatly reduced. So a couple of bad days on our roads. Starting off as a little bit of a light mix in southwestern Ontario right now, that will be changing over to all snow based on the tracking of this. It's going to come in a little bit later on tonight as flurries and a little light snow and it's not going to be that intense even towards tomorrow morning's commute now the roads are still going to be a little bit wet and I would allow some extra time but I don't want you to think oh it's kind of bypassed us there's not much going on this is going to fill in as we get towards the lunch hour and into the afternoon and those rates will become enhanced one to two centimeters maybe even one to three centimeters per hour as that snow comes down so Wednesday afternoon and evening commute will definitely not be a good one and then those winds kicking up snow squalls set up so into the snow belt we'll see some enhanced accumulations there too because this lasts really into Thursday the main system will move off it gets lighter by Thursday morning know that for the GTA but we'll still have a little bit of an impact from those squalls by tomorrow morning as I say not much going on through the GTA but still be prepared for it by afternoon it's going to be a whole different story we'll jump up to about 10 centimeters and before it's over with 15 or more centimeters that we'll be seeing. I'll have more on this coming up, Dwight. Thank you, Colette. You're welcome. The weather update is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. That storm is expected just as the City of Toronto outside workers enter into a legal strike or lockout position. That could happen at midnight tomorrow. Now, most snow-clearing crews will still be on the job, but garbage pickup in a part of the city would stop and community centres would also close. Nick Rovere now with the latest. On an unusually warm February day, it takes some extra work to keep the Kew Gardens rink in skatable condition. The girls love coming here. This is down the street from us, so it's really nice. Alex, do you like skating? Uh, I do. <laughs> but today could be one of the last skating days of the winter. With no ice time, Andrew Marhevka would normally take his grandson Alex to the rec center, but that might not be an option either. So the rec center is going to be closed too? Wow. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. That's going to be a bit of a <laughs> issue keeping him busy. Toronto's outside workers could go on strike or get locked out by the city as soon as midnight tomorrow, a possible work stoppage that could have major consequences. For residents east of Young, garbage pickup will be suspended and people on the west side might see delays due to picketing at collection stations. City-run rec centres and skating rinks will be closed and city council and committee meetings will also be cancelled since staff who help run them could be reassigned. The union representing the workers say it won't be their fault. We don't want there to be a stoppage. It will be if, but if there is, it'll be directly because of the result of the mayor wanting the stoppage. The union says Toronto is backing away from a job security clause in their last contract. The agreement protects workers with 15 years experience from being replaced by contracted workers. But it expired at the end of 2019, meaning no one who reaches the milestone now will get the same protection. The city though needs to uh, you know, remain flexible and be able to adapt to, to an ever-changing business environment as the case may be. Parents already dealing with weeks of rotating school strikes. The latest dispute could mean even more uncertainty. So what's this like combining all these possible work action? Oh, it's, it's a lot. Like it's, you know, it all kind of adds up and it gets more stressful trying to, trying to parent. So, yeah. Yes, I'm coming on the ice, sweetie. <laughs> Duty calls. Okay. <laughs> Nick Boisvert, CBC News, Toronto. After days at the bargaining table, contract negotiations between the province and the union representing Catholic teachers have broken down. The newest ask, Monday's ask, in this never-ending sort of process, um, and the nature of this process, is an enhancement to benefits. 
an expansion to their entitlements. Meanwhile, the Ontario English Catholic Teachers Association says this is not the case. The union says it's asking for smaller class sizes and more resources. The two sides resumed talks last week but have not reached a resolution. There are more strikes ahead at Ontario schools. French schools will be closed on Thursday and on Friday high schools and select boards will also close. Patients who need home care in this province often complain that the system is too difficult to navigate. The Ford government says it now has a plan to fix that. It announced significant changes today to the delivery of home care. Here's our Queen's Park reporter Mike Crawley with how those changes could affect you. Pat Maurice has had enough experiences with Ontario's home care system to know what she's talking about. She's been there as home care became an issue for her friends, her husband and especially her mother. Before she was hospitalized, uh, she was immobile, um, she was incontinent, she had started to develop dementia, uh, she needed help with everything. Yet her mother was granted only four hours of home care per week and Maurice says the system was difficult to figure out. There aren't enough people and it's not that well organized in terms of its delivery. That view is shared even by people who run the province's home care agencies. We don't necessarily know who's leaving the hospital, when they're leaving the hospital, what the plan is going to be. Ontario's health minister is promising a fix. Christine Elliott says changes introduced today will make the home care experience better for patients. They will know what to expect. They will know who to call if things don't happen exactly as they're supposed to. They will know what to have, what will happen if complications arise. Let's take a listen to your breathing. The main change will affect the nurses who assess a patient's need for home care. They'll move out from Ontario's regional health bureaucracies to instead work right in hospitals and directly with family doctors. In the long term, I believe that it will end up saving the government money in terms of helping to reduce hallway health care. The government's hope is that better home care will get patients out of hospital sooner and reduce readmissions. That would relieve pressure on Ontario's overcrowded hospitals, including the one where today's announcement was made. We know that most patients don't want to be here. They want to be home with their loved ones with their and with reliable and appropriate supports that keep them safe and well. Here at Queen's Park, the opposition New Democrats are describing Ontario's home care system as a disaster, and they're calling today's move by the Ford government mere tinkering. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Toronto. More countries beyond Asia are seeing new cases of the coronavirus, even as China reports a slowdown amid the outbreak. It's one of these scenarios which we have been warning against uh, for a couple of weeks already. Uh, that countries have to be prepared for the virus literally knocking at their door. In Europe today, Switzerland, Austria and Croatia confirmed their first cases of COVID-19, but South Korea and Italy have been seen the biggest spike in infections outside of mainland China. There are now nearly a thousand cases in South Korea where the disease has killed 11 people. Italy also reported 11 deaths, and it saw a sharp jump of 100 new infections since yesterday, bringing its total confirmed cases to 322. Most of the outbreak from the coronavirus is clustered around northern Italy, while authorities have quarantined several towns and restricted movement to contain the outbreak there. Rene Filipponi reports from one of the many roadblocks southeast of Milan. This is one of 35 police roadblocks across the region, checking cars coming in and out of what is the red zone. This is the area that's been under quarantine. There are 50,000 people in nearly a dozen communities that are not able to leave because of the high number of people who have come down with the coronavirus. It's unclear at this point how long these people will be in lockdown, but there are some supplies getting through to them. The scenes inside the red zone show streets that are empty. People are staying inside. There is a lot of fear. People don't know how bad the disease could get or how long this lockdown will last. Well, this was the last thing Italy needed. The country was already teetering on, on the edge of recession. It's hurting hotel bookings. It's hurting retailing. Uh, there have been an awful lot of cancellations already in the northern regions where, where this happened. Officials with the World Health Organization are now on the ground trying to figure out why Italy has been hit so hard with the virus. 
In order to do that, they need to figure out who patient zero is, who brought the virus to Italy. Once they can figure that out, they can get a better sense of how it spread and possibly come up with another method to contain it that isn't so drastic. One of the reasons why there's a team at this point already um, quickly dispatched to meet with the authorities is to look at the best way to prepare um, for any further spread or, of course, to contain what what we have right now. Now, there is a concern that the virus could begin to spread outside the borders of Italy. There are other countries that already have reports and confirmed viruses. The EU has been clear there will be no border checks, but the countries will have to work together to come up with a way to contain it. The Prime Minister came out today saying that it is still a safe place to travel to, but UK authorities are warning British citizens that if they are visiting this area of Italy and return to England with any flu-like symptoms, they're supposed to put themselves in self-quarantine for 14 days. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Somalia, Italy. In Iran tonight, the politician heading up that government's task force on COVID-19, who had urged the public not to overreact about its spread, has tested positive for the illness. That's Iran's deputy health minister in a video he posted about his diagnosis. On Monday, the minister could be seen at a news conference constantly removing his glasses to wipe sweat from his forehead. He says he started treatment, is in quarantine, and other than the fever, he's okay. Right now, Iran has the highest number of coronavirus deaths outside of China. Coronavirus, I think there's, there's definitely been a wake-up call for a number of uh, big businesses to kind of relook at their supply chain. I'm Talia Ricci, and coming up, we visit a couple of businesses that manufacture their products here in the city and learn why more people have been opting to have their items made in Canada.
The COVID-19 outbreak has severely impacted China's manufacturing sector. That has some local businesses re-examining where their products are made. And in some cases, that means turning to Canadian companies to get the job done. Talia Ricci explains. Closed factories in China have unexpectedly opened up new opportunities in Toronto. A lot of companies are very paralyzed in terms of their manufacturing because they've been relying so heavily on China. And so they're looking to other sources to get their goods manufactured. Enter Canadian manufacturers like this one. Foxy Originals is a jewelry company that makes their own pieces and custom designs. Slowed production in China has resulted in both U.S. and Canadian companies scrambling. It's just kind of snowballed into being even busier for us because people are in the bind. A lot of them have projects underway right now, but they can't be met and they're coming to us. And while this extra business is welcomed, these women also hope it has companies reconsidering manufacturing options closer to home. Customers are looking around for places and they're finding in their own backyard there's really high quality, um, great manufacturing options where we're really caring about the health of our workers and there's no carbon footprint because there's no transportation. And it's not just jewelry. This clothing company says they've noticed an increase in the number of customers interested in domestic production. Which is proudly made in Canada. Now with the coronavirus, I think there's, there's definitely been a wake-up call for a number of uh, big businesses to kind of relook at their supply chain um, and perhaps just diversify a little bit to mitigate risks. But Chang says her company has been promoting locally made clothing well before the outbreak, stressing that quality is top of mind. When you are manufacturing locally, especially in Toronto and Ontario and in Canada, there's really three levels of governance that are built into your supply chain um, based on laws and rules and regulations that we have to face. Hoping these new customers stick around beyond the global health emergency. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. This is a live look at the real protest happening right now near Jane and St. Clair. People are on the tracks just behind Lambton Arena. It's affecting Go Train service during tonight's commute. We'll have the very latest for you right after this break.
It has been a day of disruption for GTA commuters. Papa protests shut down GO train service on the Lakeshore East and Milton corridors through the afternoon. That's causing a backup at Union Station. Now, Metrolink says Milton GO train service has now resumed with a detour in place. An earlier situation near Guildwood GO is also clear, and Lakeshore East service has resumed. And just after 5 p.m. tonight, the protesters left the tracks near Aldershot Station, but service on that section of the GO line is still not back to normal as rail officials have to clear and inspect the tracks. GO says customers will likely experience more delays and cancellations tonight. And the protests are continuing with people blocking a portion of the Milton line right now. Romna Shazad joins us again from the Jane and St. Clair area. Romna, what's the latest there? 20 minutes, more and more people have sort of trickled in. This protest growing larger. There are two different groups here, all part of the same protests. A fence is separating the two of them. So as you can see, one group just to the side, side of the fence and then another group on the train tracks i believe they that that group over there the smaller one uh, they got through uh the fence through a hole in the fence uh everybody here though chanting together with the group on the track sort of leading the way uh and from um what i'm what i'm able to tell the overall mood here at this time pretty peaceful uh friendly uh, and the police presence, uh, just that. It's just a presence at this time. So, again, two separate groups of people, but all together in solidarity as one protest. Uh, and they're singing, there's drumming, and there's chanting. Dwight? All right, Rom, that doesn't look like they're going anywhere anytime soon. Thank you for keeping on top of that one for us. To other news tonight, we now know the cause of the fire on Gosford Boulevard that displaced hundreds of people in November. The fire ripped through the 15-story building, killing one person and injuring six others. The Ontario Fire Marshal's office revealed the fire was sparked by a space heater and that was too close to a mattress on the eighth floor. Now, residents ignored the smoke detector and didn't call 911, trying to put out the fire themselves. Firefighters were alerted by an alarm after the fire had spread to the floor's common area. About 700 people were displaced by this fire. Some residents still have not returned. Fair evasion and fines were among the issues discussed at the TTC board meeting today. The TTC says the system loses millions of dollars from people who don't pay. One city councillor has an idea to avoid all of that by making the system free for everyone. Lorenda Redekop explains. Loretta Fisher told the TTC board about how she was fined but shouldn't have been. A woman she knows came in behind her through a faulty gate. I didn't know she was going to do this because we did not have a discussion and she just walked in behind me while she was still digging for her metro pass. She says they were each fined $350. A prosecutor encouraged her not to fight it, though she did. And in the end, the transit officer didn't show up at court. It was extremely nerve-wracking. It was like it really ruined my summer for the entire summer, month after month, trying to get some advice about what to do. Hers is just one of the concerns raised today. People ride for free because they don't have the money. You can take somebody out of their housing with a $425 fine. Is that worth it? The TTC has been stepping up its enforcement. Plus, this video earlier this month got people talking, showing enforcement officers dealing roughly with a man who apparently hadn't paid. One committee member wants to take away the need for enforcement officers by making the transit system free. This is a serious matter. I don't understand why we haven't looked at it in the past. There's countries in the world that have free uh, transit. In the meeting, he asked what it would mean if the cost were borne by taxpayers. City staff weren't sure, but thought fares could be covered by a dollar a day per household. I would pay that dollar a day in order to have free TTC, so we don't have this fare invasion. The money that we're going to save on and fare inspectors and the money that we're going to have, save on the Presto card, that's going to pay for itself. Jim Karagiannis' motion on the issue passed, asking city staff to look into the cost of free TTC and report back before the end of the year. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. The illegal sale of liquor, beer and cannabis has three men facing charges tonight. It's alleged the three were selling the booze and drugs out of a commercial unit in Markham. Investigators believe two of the men were purchasing alcohol in Quebec and shipping it back here to sell in the GTA. 
Officers carried out a search warrant at the unit late last month. They found more than $100,000 worth of alcohol in a storefront and stored in shipping containers. They also located various cannabis and CBD oil products. A 56-year-old man from Brampton, a 28-year-old man from Toronto faced one count each of keeping, selling, or offering liquor for sale. A 56-year-old Markham man is also facing charges. It's another big day of celebration for a Zamboni driver turned hockey hero, David Ayers, the 42-year-old from Whitby, can also add late-night hosts to his resume. We've got a great show for you tonight, and oh, ow! Oh, God, I pulled my hamstring. I don't think I can finish the monologue. Oh, no. Don't worry, Steven, I got you. David Ayers. <laughs> Zamboni hockey hero, David Ayers, everybody. David, I've, I've pulled my hamstring. Can you help me out? I'll finish one up for you. Thanks. We got a great show for you tonight. When we get back, Warren checks Bloomberg into the board, so stick around. Yeah! Oh, that's so much fun on Saturday. He subbed in as an emergency goalie and helped the Carolina Hurricanes defeat our Toronto Maple Leafs. Not exactly a difficult feat these days. Since then, it has been nonstop interviews and TV appearances for this local hockey hero. I don't know if I ever expected it to be like this. I ended up going uh, do a couple things in Toronto, a little bit of media there, and then going to New York City yesterday, doing uh, probably 20 to 25 interviews, uh, a couple cool uh, TV appearances. <clears throat> the cold air was last night, which was kind of was fun. He was he was great. He was a good guy. And then fly out last night and get here this morning. Man, his 15 minutes is still going. The mayor of Raleigh, North Carolina, home of the Hurricanes, declared today David Ayers Day. He'll be at their game tonight as they host the Dallas Stars, where he'll be sounding the goal siren. I know you're a sports fan and you love that story, but you've been so busy in the weather center today, oh. Kalei. I don't think you're paying attention. <laughs> yeah, we love stories like that, but I wonder if he does weather. Uh, anyway, I'm here now, so let me walk you through all the things that are going on with this winter storm that is moving in. So the conditions will be poor, no doubt about it. Some of the worst is going to be the afternoon and evening commute on Wednesday, but even into Thursday, we'll have some blowing snow and reduced visibility. Snow squalls, that's the reason why we'll have those problems. And we have to uh, deal with a bit of a change in our temperatures, too, cooling down, certainly from where they were yesterday. Up uh, there, just over 9 degrees for the high. Special weather statement, that is still in place, but not for the city. It starts around Hamilton, extends back towards Windsor and up towards the north, 10 to 20 centimeters. In these areas, we have been enhanced or upgraded here in the GTA into a snowfall warning. So 15 to 25 centimeters as the system passes by. It's going to be kind of hanging around, although the bulk of it or the heaviest is tomorrow afternoon and evening because it hangs in into Thursday. Those accumulations really can get up there. Starting off as a little bit of a light mix in southwestern Ontario as that temperature comes down. Yes, it becomes snow. Now overnight tonight, light with some light snow with some flurries mixed in, patchy at times. So tomorrow morning's commute may be slower but it shouldn't be too bad. As we get towards the lunch hour and into the afternoon, though, this fills in and that snow gets heavier and it is not going to be pretty. Then, even Wednesday night into Thursday, you see those stronger winds are going to kick in and those start up the lake effect snow. So we'll even see some of those flurries making their way down towards the GTA. But in the snow belt, we'll see some pretty significant amounts. So tomorrow morning, it's negligible. But then by tomorrow afternoon, we jump up to 10 centimeters and then we're going to jump towards 15, 16 centimeters. By the way, look at Peterborough could be close to 30. As you go towards the nation's capital, 20 to 30 plus centimeters possible. Our current temperatures still mild, but they will be coming down. And this is where they're going to be coming down to. We're talking about highs of minus four and overnight Friday, overnight Saturday, much colder air in place. So Dwight, the snow is going to be hanging around. It's going to be a wintry like weekend, but you might be able to actually by then get out and enjoy it. At least the one we got before melted away, so we have room for it. Thank yes, you. we have the room. <laughs> Thank you, Colette. You're welcome. This weather update is brought to you by Fairmont Le Chateau Frontenac, the best location for your next spring break getaway in Quebec City. There's a possibility the Toronto Islands could soon flood again this summer. Water levels in Lake Ontario are already 12 centimeters higher than they were last winter. But this time, there's a plan in place to minimize damage and keep the island open. Nalina Nowski now with the details.
We're going to be raising up the elevation of the material here. Conservation work starts tomorrow, with rocks and dirt being shipped in to build up the shoreline. What the intent of that will be is to ensure that as the lake levels rise, that as the waves start to come in, there won't be as much wave action going on top and flooding the park area and everything behind us. Who can forget the swampy fields on Wards Island in 2017, with basements flooding that year and again in 2019? It was um, more of a reactive kind of scramble to get sandbags in and working with the city on getting more sand and meter bags, which are like the larger bags. And this time, the action is preventative. Build up the area near the ferry terminal on Wards Island, reinforce two main roads so they're not washed out, and fix a section of Algonquin Island. And when did you start getting an inkling or a feeling that the water levels were going to rise again? So uh, even following the following the storm and the high lake levels last year was interesting from like, our group's perspective. Over October, November, there was a lot of discussion between TRCA, the city, and as well others, anticipating that this might be a very real outcome, that we might be ready for another high lake season in 2020. The reason isn't a heavy snowfall, but water levels that never went down. All the Great Lakes are at, that connect to Lake Ontario are at higher than average water levels. So you have a lot of outflow from Lake Erie and other sources. While this work is going on, island residents are going to be tackling other sensitive areas with sandbags. A bit frustrating that year after year, I think the efforts are, uh, we have to redo everything because uh, a lot of stuff gets taken away for the winter and uh, there's constant upkeep to do. But uh, I think it's all, you know, necessary until there's a permanent solution, which could take years and cost tens of millions of dollars. There's no word yet on the current work's price tag, but the hope is to have all the heavy lifting done by May so everyone can enjoy the islands this summer. Natalie Nanowski, CBC News, Toronto. Coming up next, how the hotel industry is helping in the fight against human trafficking. One of the biggest things is actually refusing housekeeping. So, you know, constantly having that do not disturb sign on. Hotel workers are now being taught the warning signs. More on that story after the break.
Human trafficking is one of the fastest growing criminal activities in Canada and one of the most damaging. Survivors and police across the country are stepping up efforts to combat it. As Joanna Romiliotis found, the hotel industry is being enlisted in the fight. So those are some things that front desk staff can look out for. The warning signs are stark when you know them. One of the biggest things is actually refusing housekeeping. So, you know, constantly having that do not disturb sign on. Another huge one is a major demand for a lot of towels and new bedding. At a Hilton hotel in Ajax, Ontario, staff are learning how to spot the signs of human trafficking and what they can do to disrupt it. If it's an emergency, call 911. But the best thing that you can do is just be kind enough to this individual. The majority of human trafficking occurs in hotels. Police operations like this one in Durham region are about making contact with potential victims. The vast majority are young, often underage and female, manipulated and coerced into the sex trade. It's why victim services of Durham region tell hotel staff victims often can't speak freely or seem disoriented. I was trafficked all the way from Ottawa to Toronto. Samantha Banducci was trafficked by her boyfriend. She says even just a kind word from a hotel employee would have been helpful. And I think that those things are helpful, not necessarily getting in somebody's face, but kind of standing in the background just saying, I'm here if you need me. Scene two, beta, take two, mark. Raising awareness is a priority in Durham. A public service announcement was recently produced and is now online. And beyond the region, hospital emergency rooms across the country are training frontline staff to identify victims. So are truckers in the U.S. and Canada who may spot victims at rest stops. 911. As for hotels, several chains are also boosting in-house training as the demand for accountability grows. Lawyers claim that several local hotels helped sex traffickers. In, in the U.S., control. dozens of lawsuits have been filed against hotels for turning a blind eye and profiting from human trafficking. In Durham, police and victim services say hotels are a key partner and the majority are on board. Workers here say they're glad to know more. All the other staff here, we are all over the hotel. So there's things that we see that we don't really recognize or understand. And how does this change that? It's an eye-opener. And knowing what to look for is the first line of defense. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Ajax, Ontario. After the break, we look into an artistic mystery. She's an elegant woman of color in a luxurious dress, and no one seems to know her story. More on the AGO's newest purchase next.
This is Portrait of a Lady Holding an Orange Blossom, and we found the painting at an auction house in New York just a month ago. So it's been a really thrilling month of support and enthusiasm from our staff and supporters here at the AGO. A new mysterious painting is on display at the Art Gallery of Ontario. It's unlike almost all the paintings from its time period in European art. Both the artist and the subject are unknown. Yelena joins us now mm -hmm. with more on this. She saw the painting today. Let's start with what we know about it, because I've been bugging you about this. I find this so fascinating. We have been talking about this all day. It is really, really interesting to, to think that this painting, which they acquired at the AGO, it is really rare to see a woman, a woman of color. They don't know who this person is, what her background was. You get a little bit of a sense through the writing, Portrait of a Lady, and she's holding this orange blossom. They think that that's symbolic of something. But the fact that she's wearing this really opulent clothing, Dwight, this is the key. She's got lots of jewelry. And so anyone who would say that from that era that this might have been a woman who was a slave, well, there's also the fact that she might have been uh, someone who was free. Mm -hmm. And and you just don't know a lot of the details here. But what you do know is that there's an incredible amount of talent. There's a lot of craftsmanship. And right there in the corner of your screen, you can actually see a number. And that means that the original collector, they used to put stickers on their paintings in their homes. Okay. So you would catalog it and you would know what number it was. This is about 40 or so and so it was clearly held in high regard it was preserved for a very very long time and so as I say you know a painting from the 1750s this is something again that was really rare I'm gonna give you a listen right now back to that woman who's uh, responsible for this uh, the European section of the AGO have a listen to Caroline Shields what's exciting to us is the really strong depth of research that we can do because of these rich clues that are embedded in the painting. So for example, her costume is a really opulent, beautiful dress with silver earrings and pearl necklaces and bracelets. And the orange blossom itself is so purposefully placed, we know that it means something, we just have to figure out what. Okay, so now that is where things really get fascinating, Dwight, because they're really turning this into a huge research project. So get this, yesterday they ended up having a Facebook Live, and they got comments from professors around the world saying, I know a lot about that style of clothing. Someone else saying, I know a lot about that plant that you've got there, and people are kind of giving in clues. Someone else sent in a painting that looks almost like this one, mm. and similar initials at the bottom, so they think they might have found another one. So it's really exciting whenever you kind of crowd outsource these things and help to solve the mystery that way. We're going to solve this one. So what was the response like when this painting was unveiled? In yeah, the so it was fun to watch people go up and kind of take a look. It certainly stands out. I'm going to give you a listen to a few of the people who are visitors today. As I was walking around the gallery, I see that there's like a lot of white like people being like superior. So like whenever like the first thing I saw of this is like, wow, it's like really like, you know, interesting and different. It's, uh, it's a lovely painting. And uh, the girl has an interesting natural shyness to her. And so that's intriguing, I feel. Actually, this is my first time uh, coming to an art museum, yeah. We, we always see like uh, white people painting and a lot of these. But when you see, uh, it's you know, good to have some uh, diversity in the paintings. At this time period, uh, with uh, an expensive clothes, so it, I think it will grab their attention. They will try to know more about the story and who did this painting and for whom this picture. Yeah, you heard a few of them point out the fact that most of the subjects are often white. When you take a look, I'll give you a quick look around that very room. That is the case. That is what you see. Uh, and I have to tell you, this particular painting uh, that you're looking at now, these are all famous works that they've mm -hmm. got in the AGO. The one that we've been talking about, this lady, this portrait, they paid $100,000 for it. And that's after a heated bidding war, Dwight, with another museum wow. that lost out, which just goes to show that this trend now for a lot of museums to finally wake up and get more, or at least try some, to adjust yeah. some. Let's adjust address the utter lack of diversity when it comes to not just the art, but the artists, but also the people that come and visit. It all needs to be increased in terms of inclusion, obviously, and that's that's what they're trying to do. And I hope you come back when this mystery is solved. Yeah, I will. Us. I will. Thanks, Yelena. Talk to you soon. A slow, messy commute home. It's going to be a messy one tomorrow because of the weather. We'll get you caught up on the latest next.
I want to give you the latest now on disruptions that have been hitting Go Train service all day. Tonight, protesters are continuing to block Milton Go tracks near Jane and St. Clair. That is forcing Go Trains on the Milton line to detour. Go says that's likely to add about 30 minutes to train trips. Now, another delay Go was experiencing at the Guildwood station has cleared and Lakeshore East service has now resumed. And protesters have now left the tracks near Aldershot station. After a nearly 24-hour demonstration, Go is telling commuters they will likely experience more delays and cancellations tonight. And then tomorrow we throw the weather into the mix oh. of all of this. Yeah, do we ever. So you're going to need extra time. Allow extra time. It's actually the situation where if you can somehow change your day, and I know many of us can't, and avoid tomorrow afternoon and evening's commute, that would be something you may want to look at. So this evening, the temperature coming down a little bit, dropping to close to freezing overnight. Mm -hmm. The temperature is not really the story. It's the snow gets more intense tomorrow afternoon. Snowfall warning 15 to 25 centimeters. Now pay attention to this lady because she'll have it all for you tomorrow. That's it for us tonight. We'll see you back here tomorrow.